everybody. Welcome to um, the first class of Mesila Yesharim. My name is Rabbi Moses Haber. Uh, I'm excited to study with you Mesila Yesharim. Uh, the last time I did this was maybe 20 years ago when I was in a yeshiva in BMT, Beit Medrash in Israel. Uh, and I have to say that many of the things that I read then as an 18-year-old, um, I couldn't really appreciate. I didn't really have the capability of understanding how to take the ideas of the Ramhal and seed it into, uh, into, um, into my life. Because as an 18 year old, how much do you really know? You know, how much do you, um, how many challenges have you been through? And, um, and how much can you really um, know to put the lessons of the Nisida Yishadim into? So I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, I hope you see the, first page of my slideshow. I'm going to put it over here. Let's see. Hang on one second. That's not working. Hang on. Let's present. Okay. So let me get, start with the introduction to a biography of the Uh He was born in the year uh, 1707 and he lived until uh, 1746. His full name is Rabbi Moshe Hayim Luzato. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about his life. He was born in Padua, Italy, um, into a wealthy, educated family. And his parents wanted to make sure that he would have um, everything he needed in order to be a, a well uh, a person who understand, understood the Torah well and understood how the world works. So they made sure um, they give him all types of education, not just Torah education, but education in terms of philosophy uh, and different ideas in science. Uh, typical, this was what the people who lived in the Renaissance period wanted to achieve, is to have their children be very, very well versed in the Torah, but also understanding of the world around them. So therefore, he studied a lot of Torah, the uh, Mikra, the Nevi'im, the Talmud, the Geonim, the Midrashim, but also a lot of self secular knowledge. And he started to write his first book when he was uh, 17 years old. And that includes songs and poetry, a lot of Musad, and also a lot of philosophy. And that's Musad and philosophy is what we'll be talking about in this class on the Tzidai Shari. And then, around when he was uh, around, uh, around 30 years old, um, there was a big problem with called the Sabbatine movement. Shabtai Sevi um, really began to make inroads into the communities uh, in that area. And he felt it was important to start teaching a certain uh, Kabbalah to his students in order to show the beauty of Kabbalah and beauty of connecting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Um, but after a while, he was forced by, around 1730, he was forced by the rabbis of the Keilah to stop teaching Kabbalah and to stop, he used to have groups of people, of students who used to come to him and he, he would, he would, he would uh, teach that Kabbalah to them. At one point he wrote a book called The 150 Chapters. And the rabbis of uh, Italy felt that he was getting so popular that maybe the book that he wrote that had 150 chapters, the story goes that one day it would supplant the 150 chapters that we know of, which is, Famously, the book of Tehillim, written by many opinions say, David Amelech. So, so they actually, uh, rumor has it, they burnt some of his books. That I'm hot. So you can imagine, as I'm telling you the story about a person who believes in something, a person who's teaching something, a person who's fighting for something, a person who has students, um, and the leadership of the community says to him, no, you can't do this anymore. Uh, it's, we think it's actually a bad thing. Um, so the Ramhal leaves. The Ramhal leaves and he goes to another city. You know, sometimes when you're having difficulties doing what you love to do, uh, sometimes you leave. Uh, and he goes to Frankfurt. He goes to Frankfurt. He didn't stay in Frankfurt too long. And around 1735, he moved to Amsterdam. Uh, and the Portuguese, the family, the Jews from Portugal fell in love with him. Um, and they wanted to make him the rabbi of the synagogue, but he wouldn't have it. He learned um, from his experience um, in Italy that that's not what he wanted. And guess what the Ramhal did? He 
went to work into business and uh, he, I think he went into jewelry uh, and that's what he did for many, many, many years. But then in 1740, uh, he spoke to his wife and his kids. And he says, time to move, time to move again. All right, we started out in Italy. We went to Frankfurt. We were in Amsterdam. He moved to Israel. He moved to Israel and that's where he was buried. He moved to Spat and I think he moved into Akko also. And that's where he wrote uh, many, many of his books. He died at a very, very young age, at the age of 40, uh, in a magifa, in a pandemic of some sort. I know we don't want to use that word to really pandemic, but uh, he, there was some type of sickness that was going on uh, in Akko, and he died in 1743. Um, so, Rabbi Haim Luzato, um, one of the most famous books that he read is called the Mesila Isharim. The Mesila Isharim. Uh, is a famous, famous book in almost all the yeshivot. I'm not talking about uh, elementary or high school. I'm talking about the yeshivot that a, that a boy or a girl goes to um, and during their gap year program. Not only the gap year program, but any yeshivot you go to, pretty much this is required reading. This is considered the Musad book that's required reading um, for, um, for any student that wants to go to um, um, yeshiva. And I want to, uh, so this is his grave. His grave is in, he's buried in Tiberias. I don't know why his grave looks like it's on a street corner somewhere, if you can see his grave. And over here on the top right of the, of the slideshow, and I hope you can see it, um, it says, Ish po nikbar, Ish Elohim Kadosh, Lebena Moshe Hayim, Muzatu Zecher Sadiq Lebracha. And it has the year over here. He died in Iyar, Taf Kof. And it says here, if you don't know, the acronym is Tiye Nishmato Sirra Sor Hahayim. That's what we have at the bottom of all of the, um, the monuments. Tiye may, the, may his soul be bundled in the bundle of life in Shammai. Uh, and this is where he's buried in Tiberias. So if you want to go visit him, I'm not sure what the, your opinion is on uh, whether you go visiting uh, graves of rabbis, but it's nice to uh, pay your respects to his grave. Now, I want to give you an introduction. Really, it's an introduction that summarizes the Ramhal's introduction to um, to his book. Okay, I'm going to read a few lines, but we're not going to read this. We're not going to read the work in detail. Uh, I'm going to walk you through the sefer, um, um, and I'm going to lift certain lines off of the page in order to speak about it as uh, as jump off points. He starts the books. He starts, he says, Amara Mehaber, the author says, Hahibur has a lo hibati de la med de ne adam et ashe lo yedao. He's not coming here to teach you anything you don't know already. That's a very strange way to start a book. I mean, many people would just close the book right now and say, Hey, if you're not going to give me more knowledge than I had beforehand, then I don't need to read this book. You know, what's the purpose of this book if you're not going to tell me anything new? So he continues, he says, Ela lehazkiram et hayadua lehem kvar. I'm only here to remind you what you already know. Umefursam etzlam pirtsum gado. And I'm going to make something familiar with you. It's something that's very, very familiar. Kilot timsa berov devari. You're not going to find in the majority of what I'm saying. Ela devarim sherov bene adam yodim otam. I'm going to tell you something that most people already know and most people don't have any doubt. So, you know, this is important. It's important to recognize that there are things that we know that we don't really think about. And there are things that we take for granted. And I think that's what the Ramchal opens up with his book is about. There are so many ideas and so many thoughts, and so many things that we just take for granted and we don't think about them deeply enough. He says, sometimes when you take, when you take an idea for granted, listen to this, according to their familiarity and to the extent that their truth is evident to all, so pashut, so simple, so too is their neglect very prevalent and forgetfulness of them is very great. This is extraordinary. You would think that if an idea was simple, 
it would be front and center of our mind. But no, he said, the simpler the idea, the more, over, more often you pass over it. I mean, there's nothing like uh, the experience that we're going through in order to reset our mindset, to refocus us on some of the simpler things we have in life. And I think that's what he's trying, trying to tell us in this book. There are things that you would forget about unless you were reminded of them. And his book is here to organize a system of what I would call personality training or spirituality slash personality training so that you start refocusing and reminding yourself and remembering that, um, that these are important. I mean, we've all learned recently that health is so much more important than wealth. Yes, I know that people are worried about their finances. There's no doubt about it. We are all in a questionable period in terms of how much we, we can re rely on our payroll and paychecks and business. There's no doubt about it. But we've been reminded seriously about how if you don't have health, it's impossible to have wealth. We've reminded ourselves, we've been reminded of the importance of being able to work within a family unit since we're stuck together, right? I always tell my kids, and my few always told me, you could choose your friends, you can't choose your family. Uh, and most importantly, I think that his book is the importance of principles and values, right? Some of those things that we are so simple, we pass over them. Um, and it's important to remind ourselves what are important principles and values to live our life by. You know, I'm happy that I'm teaching, that I decided to teach this course because I too need to remind myself of some of the important, important ideas that the Nampal is going to bring up in his book. You know, I think about it, if you want to think of a metaphor, you know, there, there are two types of people when it, who, go, who walk through a museum. But I'm just thinking about for a second. You go to a gigantic museum, right? Let's say you go to the Met. And you walk in and you get the map. And there's so many different rooms that you want to go to. I'm not going to list them all now. There's so many different types of exhibits. There's paintings, there's sculpture, there's, um, there's uh, metal work, um, all these different types of things. Now, if you zoom through, if you run through the museum, you'll get a, a blurry understanding of all these different ideas, all these different beautiful works of art. But there's another person, type of person that says, you know, I'm going to choose one room, maybe just two paintings. Maybe just two paintings to concentrate on. And I'm going to stare at those paintings. And it's only then when you're staring at the painting that you could identify each brush stroke. I mean, you can't get too close because then the, what are they called? The assistants in the, in the, in the museum, the, um, I forgot what their names are, the docents maybe. You can't get too close, but if you sit, right, I like those benches, you sit in front of a painting and you stare at it and you see the big picture of the painting and then you see the individual brush strokes and you see how all the colors mix together and you think about the intentionality and the meditation that the artist had with putting each drop of ink or paint onto the surface and the choice of the canvas and the choice even of the um, frame and the choice of the lighting and the shadowing and the shapes, whether he want, whether, the, whether the artist wanted to do something abstract or he wanted to do something more real. But you sit there and you recognize that the simple things that you are now thinking about are necessary in order to build the entire painting. And that painting fits in a room, that room fits on a floor, that floor fits in an entire museum. So I think what the Ramchal wanted us to be doing on a regular basis, and he says this in his book, in the first chapter, he says, I'm going to tell you things you already know. And the value of this book is not when you read it once. The simple things I'm going to bring up in this book are things that you should repeat, 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 and do a lot, a lot. So that's, that's the first page of his introduction. Uh, but if we get a little bit deeper, we see that he says, you need to spend a lot more time, a lot more time um, thinking about 
these ideas. And he explains in this slide here. I'll get to the term hasidut. I know it causes some confusion in some, some people. It is the words of piety, not hasidim today that live in a certain you know, area, but hasidut means piety. The, ways that, the, the words of piety, awe of God, ahava, love of God, tarat alev, and purity of heart, they are not devarim mutbaim. They are not something innate. They're not something that you were born with, right? You're, you're not born with, um, with these concepts of awe and love of God. It's something that you need to uh, exercise your mind to acquire and deepen your relationship to, with these ideas. Okay? They're, not, they're not things that are just going to come to you. You need to work on it. Um, you know, it's not like, he says, it's not like, it's not like sleeping and eating. Sleeping and eating, you wake up in the morning, you're going to be hungry. It's automatic. Uh, later on in the, in the afternoon or the evening, you're going to get tired and you're going to fall asleep. So if a person wants to be, work on their personality and work on their spirituality, it needs work. He says there's a lot of people who live their life uh, and they don't think about these things. And these things are not important to them. And He's not saying it's good, but that's, that's, it's very possible. It's very possible to live life without ever thinking about the development of yourself and the development of your relationship with Hashem or your development of your relationship with other people or the community around you. But that's not what we want. That's not what he wants. That's not what Hashem wants, uh, as I'll tell you, as we'll get to. So I want to tell you a story, okay? I want to tell you a story that appears not in this Mesila Yishalim, but in the original version, the, one, the version of the Mesila Yishalim that you could buy at an Eichlis or Mekor Asvarim is really the second version. The original version was written as a, as a conversation between uh, two people. Uh, and it's, I happen to like the original version better, but I'm going to use the popular version because that's what's online. Um, and in the original version, he starts out early in his book, conversation between two people, a hacham and a hasid. Listen to this for a second, and this will tell you a little bit about the direction that the book is going to go. The hacham is sitting on, let's just dress it up a little bit, right? He's sitting on his porch. He's having, he has a book in his hand, and he's grappling with some of the texts, the Torah texts that he's reading, and he has a bunch of books on his nightstand, and he has a bunch of books to read in his library and in his office and all his house is filled with a bunch of books. And the hacham, the rabbi, the smart person, the intellectual, the researcher, he says to himself, wow, my job in earth, on earth is to study, study, study science, nature, astronomy, math, halakha, and to know all the ins and outs of all the different reasons of halakha and the different opinions of halakha and to understand all the midrashim, and to, and to, but the, mo the most important part of all this learning is analytical, and it's also practical in terms of doing the mitzvah. And he's sitting on his porch every day, day in, day out, and every day, day in, day out, across the street from him, lives a person who's always smiling, sometimes he's singing, he hears the kids singing in the house, and he comes and goes. He has one book in his hand, always the same book. And the, the, the Hacham sees the Hasid and he wonders to himself, why is this person so happy? Why is this person so content? Why is this person so happy with the simple things in life? He doesn't seem to be bothered by all the things I'm bothered by. So he decides to ask the Hasid over to visit. And the conversation ensues with the Hacham asks the Hasid, what's the most important thing to do? The Hasid asks back, the Hakam, what is the most important thing to do? And the Hakam says, the most important thing to do is to do the mitzvot. Is to do what's practical and to study, 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 study all the different opinions of how to do those mitzvot. And you also have to investigate the world in terms of all of the secular areas of knowledge. 
Let's put the hacham answer to the Hasid. Hasid says, whoa, wait a second. It's not only about doing the mitzvah. That's not all that you're required to do. Yes, you must do the mitzvah. But if you spend your time researching every single mitzvah and all the footnotes and all the, all the opinions and all the, the context and all that you also use with politics and with, and with sciences, you're not going to have time for a lot of other ideas. What are those other ideas? Hasid quotes from Debarim, Perek Yod, Pasuk Yod Bet. Listen to this, it's an extraordinary Pasuk. And this is really the foundation, this Pasuk, this, this book is the foundation for a lot of the work, for a lot of the ideas that we're gonna have. Quotes a Pasuk that Moshe Rabbeinu asks B'nai Yisrael. Pasuk is Ve'ata Yisrael. Ma Adonai Elohecha Shoel And now, Jews, what does God ask of you? What does God ask of you to do? What's your purpose? And the answer, Ki'im only, this is extra, I put it in both, Ki'im only, Le'ira et Adonai Elohecha, Le'lechet Bechol Derachav, Le'aba Oto, Le'avod, so the Hasid says this is this Pasuk shows that not the entire Judaism is about just doing the mitzvot. There's a tremendous backdrop to doing those mitzvot, and I could go deeper into the thing, but let me call this first principles. You know, there's a philosophical idea out there. Not a Jewish idea, but it's called first principle. So I'm going to borrow that, that term. First principle theory is, is that every decision that you make has to go back to certain foundational principles and you make your decisions based on those principles. So the Hasid says to the, to the Hacham, I agree that there's a tremendous amount of importance in terms of doing the mitzvot. But if you look on my list here, how I broke down this pasuk, right? Well, I did was break it down into five. Five is lishmor et mitzvot adonai et chokotav. You have to watch over and keep, rather, rather keep the commandments that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave. Yeah, but what about the first four concepts? The Hasid says to the Hacham. You're only concentrating on number five. Hasid says we have the yirat adonai elohecha. What is yirat? Yirat literally means to be in awe. In awe of the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, everybody here knows that when they're standing in front of somebody that in awe of, hopefully it's somebody who is a tremendous Tamil Hacham, right now in awe of other people who are celebrities um, or political leaders. But you know when you're standing in front, of, in front of somebody that you're in awe of, you're a little bit shy. You get shy. You get shy about what you're going to say. You're like, ah, uh, you, you, get, you, get you stammer a little bit. And you also get shy about how you're going to act, right? You're always very, very conscious about how you're going to act in front of somebody who you're in awe of, whoever that is. Maybe who's very, very wealthy sometimes. That is Yirat Hashem. Yirat Hashem is that you are, you are so in awe of his, his, his gidula, his romimut, is that you're shy about how you act, what you say, all the time. You're shy. You're just more, I wouldn't say embarrassed. It's not embarrassment. It's more about conscious to make sure you're doing the right thing. The Hasid says, this is on my mind all the time. Being an orphan. Number two. To walk in his ways. Now, what are his ways? The famous Gemara. This is Afatarahum, right? Just like Hashem is merciful, so too you should be merciful. Continues. Just like he's Hanun, just like he's compassionate, you should be compassionate. Just like he's truthful, you should be truthful. That's what it means to walk in his ways, right? Um, it, you walk in a way, you choose to walk in life in a way that is good for you and good for other people, right? It's never a, it's always a win-win. It's not win-lose, it's not lose-win. You choose to surround your peop- yourself with people and you choose to do certain things that are good for everybody. And everybody recognizes that the reason why you're doing this is because HaKadosh Baruch Hu um, directly to do so. Number three, Ahavaoto. Right? So when you're 
when you're with your father or your mother, you want you, everybody here is or your spouse. You want to make sure that whatever you're doing are pleasing to them. That's love, right? When you ha have parents and you go to their house, you try your best to make them happy. You love them, so you want to make them happy. You want to please them. And you don't want to do anything that's going to make them unhappy. Yes, we all make mistakes. We're all human beings, right? When you come home to your spouse, you want to please them. You want to make sure that your decisions are to make them happy. So that's Ahavat Hashem. Ahavat Hashem, different than Yerat Hashem. Yerat Hashem is you're, 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 you're shy a little bit. You don't want to be careful about what you say. But here is you, you love Hashem so much that you want to please him. Number four. You want to make sure to be shalim. Shalem means pure. Shalem means whole. It means that when you're serving Hashem, this is very, very difficult. When you're serving Hashem, let's say praying for a second. You have 100% pure intention and purpose that it's for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that it's not for you. Right? That's what the explanation is. Abudat Hashem b'shelemut halib. Shelemut halib means totality of heart, means that you're in it not for yourself. You're in it because HaKadosh Baruch Hu said it. That's Avodah Hashem. Right? We do an Avodah, we do service to Hashem because Hashem says not because there's some type of ulterior motive. And then the, the Hasid says to the Hacham, then you have what's called Shemirat Mitzvot. So these are the first principles. And if you're only thinking about first principles and you're focused on them, the Hasid says to the Hacham, you know, you don't have anxiety. Right, the hacham all the time he's like worried about how much information he could uh, absorb and how to understand all these different things, um, and and that gave him a certain amount of unease and a jealousy. I think of the hasid. The hasid was able to carry on his life very calmly, very happily, because he knew that he was working on these five principles, and that's what important was to him. Now, this reminds me. A book called the Chovot Levavot by Ibn Fakuya, Bahia Ibn Fakuya, and he wrote it in around I think 900, maybe a little bit later. He called it he called it duties of the heart. Why? Because he realized that a lot of people were walking around doing all the mitzvot with their hands and with their feet. Right? They would put on tefillin, they would walk to Beth Knesset, they would light the candles, but there was no lit. There was no heart to it. And he wrote an entire book. I didn't get through it yet. I didn't conclude it yet. Very difficult. Um, in order to show the people the importance of your mindset, right? Of what you're concentrating on and what motivates you to do the mitzvot. It's not only the mitzvot. It's the entire framework for how to think about mitzvot and how to put those mitzvot into action. You can't just do it. I mean, you have to just do the mitzvot. I'm not saying a person has to understand the mitzvot before they do them. A lot of people think, I won't, I won't do a mitzvah until I understand it. I think that's a problem. I guess that shows a lack of imunah and bitachon and Hashem. Hashem gave us the mitzvah, do it, and then figure it out, right? You, know, you don't have to wait. It's not a business relationship where you have to check off the details and then see if you agree before you do it. That, that was done already, Har Sinai. Har Sinai and the, and, and the and Israim and Kibushat Israel, Kibusha Aretz, all that was God's proof to us that everything is at work. You don't have to understand to do it. Do it, and then, and then. But the point is, what's your motivation every day when you're walking around? It's these things. And then she got them. So I want to show you that you know the Ramhal now gives us a blueprint, a blueprint for the rest of his sefer, and this is the, the end of the introduction to the sefer. He says, "Well, how am I going to organize a book?" Right, a book that I really think it's, it's personality and spirituality training. How am I gonna How am I gonna organize it for you? Because I'm going to base it on uh, something that I found in Masechet Abu Dazrat, the Beraita. Beraita is like similar to Mishnah. It was written at the same time, but it wasn't included in the Shisha uh, Sudeh Mishnah. I'm gonna base it on this this Beraita, and this Beraita is based on something that we could all agree with, right? We could all agree that actions and thoughts have consequences. 
we can all agree, right? Basic scientific theory that cause and effect. You have a cause, you have an effect. You have a cause. One thing leads to another. So he says the following. And this is literally the chapter headings for Misilai Shalim. Let me start reading from the top. Mikan Amarabi Pinhas Ben Yair. Torah Mevi'a Lide Zehirut. Zehirut Mevi'a Lide Zirizut. Zirizut Mevi'a Lide Nikiyut. Nikiyut Mevi'a Lide Pirishut. Pirishut Mevi'a Lide Taara. Taara Mevi'a Lide Hasidut. Hasidut Mevi'a Lide Anava. Anava Mevi'a Lide Yirat Het. Yirat Het Mevi'a Lide Kidusha. Kiddushah mevi'ah l'deh ruach ha-kodesh, and ruach ha-kodesh mevi'ah l'deh t'chiyat mitzvah. So I'm going to read you some of these things in English, very fancy English, but the point of our classes will be to go through each one of these chapters. We're going to work on the concept of watchfulness. Then we're going to move on to zeal. Then we're going to move on to cleanliness. What kind of cleanliness do we need? Physical cleanliness, spiritual cleanliness. We're going to talk about separation. Separation is pretty shoot. We're going to talk about purity, which is tara. We're going to talk about hasidut, which is, again, piety or saintliness. We're going to move on to humility. Humility leads to yirat ha'et, fear of sin. And fear of sin leads to holiness. And holiness leads to what's called the hayat imitim, which is also a confusing concept, um, which we'll get to hopefully. So these are all the principles, the first principles um, that he wants us to concentrate and review, 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 review. And in each, with each principle here, with, with each concept, he's going to teach us how to acquire it, the kinyan. And what do I mean by acquire? You can't go out and buy. You have to think about it and own it. And he's also going to teach us the deterrence, right? Things that will make it hard to be zahir, to be naki, to be parush, to be tabtara. And he's, all the things that are going to deter, deter us from, from, from being there. Um, He's going to explain to us how to re remove those deterrents. So I really think that this um, this um, book, Masila Yishayim, the path of the just, written by the Ramchal, is very very important for us to be learning and studying, and also to make it part of our regular reading in order to review some of these very very important ideas that that we talked about. Um, at the end of the day, I just want to say that a lot of people who are called Hasidim are called saints get a get a bad rap. They get a bad rap because they do a, they do a lot of tefillah, and they do a lot of teilim, and they have a lot of personal humrot. And the Rampal says, it's not, it's not okay to, to give them a bad rap for that. They're trying to work on themselves, and they're trying to bring themselves closer to an understanding of who they are, and who, who HaKadosh Baruch Hu is. Um, these are deep, deep spiritual values, uh, psychological values that we need to perfect. Uh, and that is the way of mental exercise of becoming better and better and better. So I hope to see you all next week. I'm happy to take any questions um, that you might have um, before we...